what I want to talk about now is an idea that was first developed by Miranda Fricker, who's a philosopher represented here. So she wrote an important book called Epistemic Injustice, Power and the Ethics of Knowing. It's been cited 4,293 times since it was published in 2007. So as you can tell, it's been a very influential book. So what is epistemic injustice? It is a wrong done to someone as a knower or a transmitter of knowledge. So it's a harm that's done to you in your capacity as a knower. Namely, due to unjustified prejudice, someone is unfairly judged to not have the knowledge or reasonable beliefs that they actually have. For example, a black defendant in court might encounter jurors who have prejudices against them to think that they might be untrustworthy. That's an example of epistemic injustice. So their testimony is downrated because of a prejudice that the juror has, even though there's no foundation for it. There's no good reason to think that they're less trustworthy than other people. Another example was a corporate executive in a large business who happens to be a woman whose opinions are dismissed as hysterical or irrational simply because she's a woman and her colleagues are, are men who have prejudices against women. And another example that the author gives is a doctor dismissing a woman's serious consider concerns about postpartum depression as merely a case of the baby blues. In Fricker's account, she gives basically an account of two different types of epistemic injustice. One she calls testimonial injustice, and another she calls hermeneutical injustice. So, as we've seen so far, there can be no knowledge, especially not the kind of knowledge that we're interested in, in modern science, without epistemic interdependence. But just in general, it's very hard to imagine how anyone could have knowledge without relying on and trusting other people. And as we've seen defended, epistemic interdependence requires trust, but we haven't looked at this other really influential and important topic in social epistemology, namely testimony. So testimony is an important notion. Someone gives you testimony when they share their knowledge with you. So testimony occurs when someone shares their knowledge with someone else. Testimony is not just something that happens in the courtroom, although that is an important example of testimony. But testimony occurs whenever we gain knowledge from other people. So when someone gives you directions, when someone tells you a piece of news, when someone shares their research with you, those are all examples of testimony that social epistemology is interested in. And credible testimony is testimony when we have good reason to believe that the person testifying knows what they claim to know. So testimonial injustice that we were just talking about is a case where someone's credibility is downgraded due to prejudice. So there's no reason for the downgrade other than the person's prejudice against that person. So testimonial injustice, like I said, is when a person's testimony is deemed less credible because of prejudice and not because the testimony itself is unreasonable. And these prejudices can come from a lot of different sources. They can be related to race, to gender, a person's accent, age, and other reasons. So one example that I thought of when I was thinking about testimonial injustice was when I was in Arkansas, I brought my car to a, a mechanic, and the mechanic who owned the place had two daughters who had grown up and worked in the business their entire childhood, and they were now in their 30s, and they were the head mechanics. And I was talking to the father at a certain point. He often encounters clients who are skeptical about his daughter's abilities until he came in and vouch for them. And when I went to look for images of female auto mechanics in order to tell this story in my little lecture, I found that this is something that is a recurring phenomenon around the world. I found all these examples of women who worked as mechanics who were consistently, basically had their knowledge of auto mechanics downgraded simply in virtue of people's prejudice against women being unmechanical. Another example I wanted to discuss is from 
the famous American novelist and essayist and civil rights leader from the 60s and early 70s, James Baldwin. So in 1962, James Baldwin wrote a famous letter, I'll share it with you on Moodle, called A Letter to My Nephew. And in it, he writes to his 15-year-old nephew the following line, you know, and I know, that the country is celebrating 100 years of freedom, 100 years too early. So in 1963, it was going to be a 100-year celebration of the 1863 Emancipation Proclamation. And Baldwin is saying, we're celebrating emancipation, freedom of black people in America, 100 years too early. So it hasn't been 100 years of freedom. It's been 100 years of unfreedom, continued unfreedom. And there probably will not be freedom for black Americans for another 100 years, is what he's saying. When he says this, when he writes this out, he says, I know your countrymen do not agree with me here, and I hear them saying, you exaggerate. They do not know Harlem, and I do. So do you. Take no one's word for anything. Trust your experience. So this is a great example of someone experiencing testimonial injustice, even as they're writing. So even as Baldwin is writing this letter, he's anticipating his critics saying, you exaggerate. He's anticipating the backlash from white Americans who think, well, it's really not that bad at all. But he's insisting that he has a kind of experiential knowledge that they lack. He grew up in Harlem. He lives in Harlem. He knows what Harlem is like. They don't have that knowledge. So it's an interesting case of testimonial injustice where his testimony is being downgraded even though he has a special kind of experiential knowledge that his critics lack. Another form of epistemic injustice Fricker writes about is hermeneutical injustice. So hermeneutics has to do with interpretation. That's all hermeneutics means. It's the science of interpretation. And hermeneutical injustice occurs, according to Fricker, when a person lacks the concepts they need to adequately understand or communicate an experience. And this lack is due to prejudice or unjust social arrangements. So the example that's given in your text is sexual harassment. Here's an example of a man sexually harassing his coworker. Don't do that. Don't come up behind people and creepily grab their shoulders at work. That's sexual harassment. And the piece that I asked you to read says, women's partial exclusion from certain professions, for example, journalism, politics, academics, and law, tended to result in biased interpretations of women's experiences as in interpreting sexual harassment as merely a form of flirting. So it's hermeneutical injustice because women in the workforce didn't yet have the conceptual repertoire. Something bad was happening at work. It was making them uncomfortable. They felt harassed. But there wasn't this language of sexual harassment and this kind of legal landscape where they could actually bring charges against people because the concepts hadn't been developed yet. And the reason why prejudice is the source of this lack of conceptual repertoire is because women had been historically excluded from the practices where that conceptual repertoire was eventually developed. So that's the idea. And I thought I'd give you another example. So this is ta Coates, who wrote Between the World and Me, which is a book that came out in 2015, which many people have compared to James Baldwin's letter to his nephew. So this was a letter to his son, who was the same age as Baldwin's nephew when Baldwin wrote the letter to him. And in this work, ta Coates talks about growing up in a very poor part of Baltimore, where there is a lot of crime and gangs and so on. And he talks about having this experience where he knew that something was off. He knew that it was only people like him who had to be told, do really well in school be twice as good as anyone else, otherwise you'll end up dead or in prison. So he knew little white kids weren't being told, do really well in high school or you'll end up dead or in prison. And he knew it had something to do with the fact that he was black and growing up in America, but he didn't have the educational resources that he needed to really articulate where his predicament came from. So I thought that that was an interesting example of hermeneutical injustice in the sense that Fricker intended it. So a question that I'd like you to think about before you come to seminar this week, an another question I'd like you to think about is, what could we do to mitigate these forms of injustice, these forms of epistemic injustice? 
What sort of strategies could we develop to try to alleviate them in some way? Please, again, take a moment to pause and think about how you would answer that question and bring those thoughts with you to seminar this week. I'd love to hear what they are.